Now this is part B and this one um, we simply want to look at storage and transportation. We have been able to collect the blood or the blood components. How do we store them? How do we transport them in the situations of transport? Either from a blood drive where it was outside the transfusion facility or maybe you are transporting between one blood bank to another blood bank, or you're transporting between the transfusion facility and the ward where the patient is waiting for transfusion. So in this case, we will discuss, or you should be able to discuss by the end of this lesson, the different methods for storage of blood and their transportation and the different types of refrigeration and maintenance of temperature inside the blood bank. So we start with a small introduction that a collection of blood from donors can take place within a transfusion center or a hospital blood bank. But also it often takes place during mobile blood collection sessions. Therefore, the blood is then taken to the laboratory for testing and processing into the various components. And of course, after processing, storage, and later distribution as the need arises. Now, of course, we said that blood is collected at the body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, but for it to maintain its vital properties, it should be cooled to a temperature of below 10 degrees for it now to be transported and, of course, also stored under refrigeration temperatures of around 4 degrees until it is used. Now, in transit, we should not exceed at least 24 hours. I mean, not at least, actually, it is maximum. We should not get to 24 hours. The earlier, the better. If you have to move blood from one place to another, the most minimum that you can do is best. But you cannot, or, uh, you cannot exceed 24 hours. We have what we call a blood cold chain. And this term begins at the moment the blood has been collected and it continues until it is being transfused into the patient. So this blood cold chain is a series of interconnected activities that involve equipment, personnel, and of course processes that are critical for the safe storage as well as transportation of blood from the time it is collected to the time it is transfused, okay? Now, what happens if we don't observe blood cold chain? One of the things that could happen is that if blood is stored or transported outside the temperatures that have been stipulated, it will lose its ability to transport oxygen and of course also uh, remove carbon dioxide to and from tissues respectively upon it being transfused into the patient. So it ends up not being of any importance. Then other factors of serious concern are the risk of bacterial contamination. If you keep it in certain warm temperatures, then there is risk of now, the blood was good, it was also screened and there was no infection, but then it gets a bacterial infection and contamination that now can be transferred to the patient. And of course, if blood is exposed now to extremely low temperatures that are not important or that are not um, are stipulated, then you are likely to hemolyze red blood cells and this can also be fatal when you do transfusion. So I will discuss the safe storage of blood in the various blood components. So for whole blood and red blood cells, their storage temperature is between 2 to 6. Normally, we say 4 plus or minus 2, okay? So, 2 degrees to 6 degrees is the storage for whole blood and red blood cells. And, of course, if it's not stored under this, the oxygen carrying capacity is greatly reduced. 
Now, the anticoagulant or preservative solution in the blood bag usually will have nutrients for the blood during storage and it will stop the blood from clotting. We have a whole lesson on the anticoagulants, so we'll be discussing them in details. Then the red blood cells can carry and deliver oxygen only if they remain viable. So this is the temperature 2 to 6 for whole blood and red blood cells. So storage and transport of whole blood, uh, if you are transporting pre-processed, pre-processed means you have whole blood that probably you want to extract platelets, you want to extract red blood cells. So that means it is pre-processed. The temperature range that should be there, it should be between 20 to 24, and this can only be done less than six hours. Okay, now, if you have a uh, processed blood or it is still pre-processed and you store it between two to six, it is approximately viable for 35 days. If you transport processed blood, you can use two to 10, but make sure it is less than 24 hours. So this helps us actually maintain quality such that if you have this temperature, maybe you are not able to transport it at 2 to 6, but you can transport it 20 to 4, 24, and ensure that it reaches the destination within 6 hours, from which now you can now put it in the correct temperature so that it is a little bit more viable. And you can still see it is not for very long. It is about 35 days from where now uh, we, 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 we will be looking at quality assurance and how you discard blood that is not viable or quality for transfusion. Then uh, FFP, which is separated uh, from whole blood, must be done within six hours. And these are the six hours we are talking about here. We are saying transport of pre processed blood within six hours. So for you to process, you could be wanting to get fresh frozen plasma. Now immediately you have done that, rapidly freeze at minus 30 degrees or lower then usually ffp once you have thawed it now you have removed it from the freezer and allowed it to get to uh, lower temperatures it has a shelf life of 24 hours if you store it at one to six degrees okay and of course this one to six uh, because plasma contains water electrolytes clotting factors and other proteins such as al albumin usually are able to stay stable around that temperature. So if you though only 24 hours, and of course, remember we cannot refreeze after we have thawed, that is it. So these are the permitted storage times for FFP and cryoprecipitate, which usually contains anti-clotting factors. So minus 30 or below for both of them, you can store them for a maximum of one here. Platelet concentrate, so what we call platelet-rich plasma or platelet concentrate PC, must be separated from whole blood again within the six hours we talked about where you have pre-processed blood. And then uh, once we have uh, uh, gotten our PC or PRP, we keep it between 20 to 24. Okay, so whole blood... I mean, whole blood should be kept between 20 to 24 until it is processed into uh, platelet concentrates. And now for steel platelet, you can now still store it at 20 to 24. So usually, remember whole blood, we said the best temperature is 2 to 6. But now if you are removing platelets, then ensure that the blood is between 20 to 24. Get your platelets and then now the platelet remain at 20 to 24 and then your whole blood, the remaining blood, put it at uh, 2 to 6. So we have this uh, platelet concentrates and how much they can stay at this temperature. So if you want to store these platelets at 20 to 24, it can stay for at least five days. Now, after issue, that is before transfusion, it can only be viable within 30 minutes. So then that means that this temperature ensure that it is uh, what we call, we will be looking at what we call refrigerators within the hospital ward or where the maybe surgery is taking place so that blood is maintained at this temperature. And then within 30 minutes, 
after it is removed, then it can be transfused. Then we have what we call pooled platelet preparation, where you are getting platelets from different blood donations. Okay, that's called an open system because you are removing blood from different storage uh, blood bags. And this in this system, because it is not uh, very easy to control sterility, blood should only uh, these platelets should only be used within four hours. But if you are doing pooled platelets in a closed system, that is only platelets within one blood bag, then it is possible to use it within the five days that we talked about when we were saying uh, storage at the beginning. But all this temperature is 20 to 24. Plasma derivatives such as albumin and immunoglobulins, usually these ones are obtained from large pools of donor plasma so we have to do pools because of course IgGs, IgEs and of course even albumin cannot uh, we can't have enough concentration if we get it from one blood donation so usually there is involvement of large pools of donor plasma and therefore it is a complex process pharmaceutical process called plasma fractionation and it is essential to store all plasma derivatives according now to the manufacturer's instruction. And then we also do what we call cold chain for samples. That is cold chain for blood. Now there is cold chain for samples. Remember the samples we aliquot from the sampling bag so that we can use them for testing for HIV, other bacterial infections, antibodies, doing blood grouping. So those samples and their reagents we will also need to be stored through a cold chain system. And this is usually stipulated by the manufacturers as well as um, uh, uh, what we call generated SOPs within the laboratories. So the storage and transportation of reagents as well as blood samples that are used for screening is also critical in addition to the blood storage. So manufacturers will recommend their methods and will also generate SOPs within the transfusion facility. And then these recommendations must be followed to avoid any deterioration of reagents so that we don't have poor performance. And then most important, test the blood samples. I know this is something you know. Once the blood samples have gotten to the lab, test them as rapidly as possible because the longer they take to be tested, the poorer the results are going to be. Then the method of collection, storage, and transportation of blood samples will also depend on the type of laboratory test that is also going to be carried out because also different tubes that are going to be needed for collection and storage, etc. We will be looking at that in another lesson. Now, there is what we call um, collection uh, to, from, I mean, transportation from collection site to the lab when we have done collection outside or in mobile blood donation drives. So in such a case, then the blood and blood com uh, components that are collected at donor sessions should be transported in appropriate conditions uh, to ensure st the temperatures are well, security is good, hygiene, according to SOPs, okay? Now, after collection, blood should be cooled between two to 10. Remember we said that we can transport blood two to 10. But if you are going to do platelet concentrate, it must be between 20 to 24 and make sure it is just within six hours. Then blood units should be transported from the collection site to the component preparation laboratory as soon as possible. But you know, the, the but you know, uh, between the collection and centrifugation so that you can separate uh, uh, components, do not exit six hours. At least soon as possible could go to the maximum 24 that we talked about, but let it just be six hours. Six hours is the best time to ensure that your transfusion components are very viable for transfusion. Now, depending on the distance, because sometimes maybe the blood donation site is far away, depending on where it is coming from, we can have special gel pouches that can be used to store, that are able to maintain this concentrate, especially those that you need to prepare platelets. 
you can be able to maintain them between 20 to 24, okay? Then if these gels are not available, put the blood between 2 to 10, but do not prepare platelets. So if it is very far, then just do other blood components and forego platelets because platelets must be the blood should come in between 20 to 24. Otherwise, there will be going to be there is going to be uh, um, the platelets are going to uh, ag aggregate and clamp and clamp together. Then, if you are transporting blood from one blood bank to another blood bank, okay. The temperature for whole blood and packed red blood cells still remains to be 2 to 10, okay? And then we can have specially designed blood boxes. And if these blood boxes are not available, we can uh, insulate containers that can be after evaluated and validated to ensure that they maintain the temperatures between 2 to 10. And, and usually appropriate coolants and ice, ice packs can be used. And this is the blood transport box. And also uh, now when you have a styrofoam and then use gel ice packs because you don't have this blood transport box, okay? Uh, in cases of improvisation, but the best, just use a blood transport box. For FFP and cryoprecipitate, um, the transport of this uh, must be maintained at or below the required storage temperature. Remember we said for these two, the storage temperature is minus 30 or below. Now, if you're transporting this, then usually you need to use wet ice or dry ice. So the temperatures are almost or even uh, around minus 80, around minus 7.8, I mean 78.5 degrees Celsius. So you need to use quite low temperatures when you want to transport them so that by the time you get to where their destination is, now you maintain the temperature at around minus 30. Then platelet concentrates, I think I have overemphasized, every effort should be made to ensure that platelets are maintained between 20 and 24 during shipment. And this can be used, uh, can be done uh, using a well insulated container without added ice and it is often sufficient but just ensure whatever you use it is between 20 to 24. Now the last thing is we need to issue blood components to clinical areas that is the ward that is the uh, surgery rooms the theaters and all that so now this is another transportation because sometimes they are not in the same location within the hospital. So when blood is issued from the blood bank, the time of issue must always be recorded. At what point has it left the transfusion facility into the clinical area like the ward? And then blood should be issued in a cold box or an insulated carrier that will keep the temperature under 10. We talked about one, uh, 2 to 10 degrees. Now, only one unit of red cell should be removed from the blood bank refrigerator at a time unless there is rapid transfusion of large quantities of blood, okay? Now, platelet concentrates, we talked about this again, ensure that they are issued from the blood bank in a carrier that keeps them between 20 to 24 degrees. Then platelets should be transfused as soon as possible. And if they are unused, they should never be placed in a refrigerator but returned immediately to the blood bank okay so in case they are not used to return them immediately using the insulated box again at 20 to 24 and return them to the blood bank and then ffps and cryo precipitate now usually are though remember they are at minus 30 or below so they will need to be thawed within the blood bank before they can be transported. So you throw them between 30 to 37 degrees in the blood bank before issue, and then transport to the ward at ambient temperature or the surrounding temperature, which will range between around 30 to 37. Then this must be used immediately and can never be refrozen, okay? 
So if it is not used, then it must be discarded. There is what we call, I think I mentioned at some point, that we have what we call a hospital ward refrigerator, just to ensure quality in cases where maybe you have removed blood and blood components from the blood bank, then they get to the ward and something happens and they cannot be transfused immediately. So at least having a refrigerator there will also help. So the blood bank personnel are responsible for the issue of blood to the respective hospital ward, normally at the understanding that the blood must be transfused within 30 minutes. So the refrigerator here should maintain a temperature of 2 to 6, okay? And it must be fitted with an appropriate alarm so that in case this shifts upwards or even downwards, then it can be corrected. Then blood bank staff should also be able to access this refrigerator so that they're able to monitor temperature and also uh, retrieve unused blood. Now, the ward staff must also be trained on the procedures of using these refrigerators, and there should be a, a, a regulation, for example, that we cannot have any other components within this refrigerator. It is simply storage of blood and blood components. No other consumables within the ward should be placed there, even if it's for a short period. So this hospital ward refrigerator for blood should be purely blood and blood components. Now, after all this is said and done, the blood unit must be discarded if it has been out of the refrigerator for more than 30 minutes. Discard, that's a waste. So this is a process that requires uh, us to work in very good unity between the blood bank and the clinical area. Then if you find that the seal is broken, discard. If there is any sign that the pack might have been opened, discard. If there is any sign of hemolysis, discard. So these are situations which you cannot compromise. Just discard that blood and blood component. So I have just put these two slides now here to summarize what I have just said. And I hope that it is clear. Now the first summary is... Um, Whole blood and packs red blood cells must always be maintained at 2 to 6. And if they are being transported, we can go to 10. That is 2 to 10. Okay. Then blood components and plasma derivatives should never be stored in an unmonitored equipment. We talked about using alarms, ensuring that we have fridges that can indicate for us. And also checking temperature at least twice a day. Red cells, platelets, and whole blood must never be allowed to freeze. We only freeze FFP and cryoprecipitate. Then the optimal storage temperature for conditions for FFP and cryoprecipitate is minus 30, and they must always be frozen solid. Then platelets must be stored within 20 to 24. And of importance is that there should be constant agitation so that we avoid them clamping together and they should be transported within this range of temperature. Then during transportation, frozen components must be maintained at a temperature that ensures they will remain frozen. Remember we said at around minus 78, minus 80 in dry ice or wet ice. It is important to use a temperature monitor during transportation something that can indicate to you if temperature has actually changed in the course of transit in order to check temperature ranges on receipt of shipment before you can even open up that blood carrying uh, uh, equipment. Then to assist the maintenance of temperatures for blood components, it is often useful to have hospital wards possess a refrigerator, which is used for, for short-term storage of issued blood that is coming from the blood bank. Uh, 